Welcome to Electron Line. In this video, we're going to calculate the moment required to keep a thrust bearing rotating because of the friction trying to slow it down. So the moment required to overcome the friction. And so what we have to realize here, we'll take as an example a hollow axle. So it has an inner radius R1 and an outer radius R2. And since the moment that the friction causes is dependent upon how far away from the center rotation the friction is occurring, we will have to integrate over the available surface right here. Keep in mind that the friction force is always calculated to be the normal force times mu, and in this case the normal force would be the force applied, I call this F sub P for the force of the push, pushing the bearing into the housing right there. So if you're going to integrate across the surface, starting from R1 to R2, because that's the range of the radius, we take a small little surface element called dA, which in polar coordinates is R dr times d theta. R d theta is the width here, and dr is the change in the radius, so that would be R dr d theta. So what we're going to calculate here is the moment caused by just a small little area element, and we can calculate that by the following. We know that dm, the moment, is going to be equal to the force times the radius, the moment arm of the motion. And so the force is going to be the df friction times the radius r. And of course, the df friction is going to be equal to the d normal times mu sub k, and I'm going to put that at the end, times the radius r. So what we're trying to do now is calculate the portion of the normal force pushing against this part of the surface here. Well, that's going to be equal to the ratio of the surface area of a small little element divided by the total surface area there. So, in other words, the normal force only on this portion is going to be equal to the ratio of the area here divided by the total area, multiplied times F sub P. So, dm is going to be equal to dn, which is the force by which we push the bearing into the housing, times the ratio of the dA divided by A, that will only give us the portion of the force on this small little segment, that will be the small dn, times r, times mu sub k. And now all we have to do is relate dA to the total area, and so dm can now be expressed as being F sub p, times dA, which is defined here, r dr d theta, divided by the area of the surface here. Now, of course, if this r1 is 0, it simply would be pi r squared, but we'll have to subtract the pi r1 squared from that. So this would be pi times r2 squared minus r1 squared, which is the surface area of this portion of the bearing, excluding the hole that's in the middle there. So that would be the dA divided by the total area times r times mu sub k. Then we realize since we're going to have to find m, we're going to have to integrate both sides, we can separate things from which are constants from those which are variables. So we can say that dm can now be written as f sub p times, uh, let's see here we have a mu sub k in the numerator, so f sub p times mu sub k divided by pi times r2 squared minus r1 squared and multiply that times r squared because r times r gives us r squared dr d theta and now to find the total moment all we have to do is integrate this which means we're going to integrate that and of course since there's two variables r and theta we're going to have to do a double integral on this side. So now we're ready to go ahead and integrate, integrate that so the moment which is equal to the integral of the dm which is equal to the force of the push times mu sub k divided by pi r2 squared minus r1 squared times, now we have two integrals here, the first integral is going to be for r equal, well from r1 to r2, and then theta is going to be from 0 to 2 pi. So we're going to integrate from r1 to r2 in radius and from 0 to 2 pi in circumference of the circle. And that would be r squared dr d theta. 
Okay, when we integrate, we'll get the following. So this is equal to, we still have the constants, f sub p mu sub k divided by pi r squared, r2 squared minus r1 squared times, when I integrate r squared, I get r cubed over 3 evaluated from r1 to r2. And then multiply times the integral of d theta, so theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. So when we do that, I know it's a little bit sloppy, but I like it's just saves a little board space. I did both integrals like that. So now when we collect all common terms, we get the following. We get f sub p mu sub k. We get a 2 pi in the numerator here, divided by, we get a 3 pi times r2 squared minus r1 squared. We have all that, and then I still have to plug in the upper and lower limit for r cubed. So in the numerator, we'll get r sub 2 cubed minus r sub 1 cubed. There we go. And then we can simplify this a little bit. We can get rid of that. We can get rid of that. And with other words, this then becomes equal to 2 thirds f push times mu sub k times, in the numerator, we get r sub 2 squared minus r sub 1 squared, oh, not squared, but cubed, 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 divided by r sub 2 squared minus r sub 1 squared. Uh, let me write that a little bit better. There we go. And so this here becomes the moment required to overcome the friction. So to keep the axle turning, you will have to apply that much moment in order to compensate for the friction. Now, what happens to that equation when r1 becomes 0? So when r1 equals 0, then of course, this drops out, this drops out, and then r2 cubed divided by r2 squared simply becomes r2 by itself, no exponent. So that means that, therefore, the moment then reduces to 2 thirds the force of the push times mu sub k, times r sub 2, or simply the radius of the axle. So those are the two equations that will come in handy when we start doing some problems involving thrust bearings. And that's how it's done.